Fierce and Strict of Particular Baptists by David Clark. Chapter 19. At this stage, I think it important to explain my reason for leaving the Pentecostal Holiness Church when I was 23 years old, just three years after my conversion. I felt it right to leave the Pentecostal Church that I'd associated with and attend the Beer and Strict of Particular Baptist Church in 1973. I felt I could no longer in conscience stay or continue at the church even though I had affection for all the people there when there was a company of people across the road at the Beer and Strict Baptist that held to and professed the very gospel I had received. From that time I commenced to attend as a member of the congregation at this cause of truth. I began to attend the Beerton Church in 1973. A friend who lived in Wendover, Mr Alan Benning, informed me that the strict and particular Baptist church at Beerton believed the doctrines of grace and that a Mr James Hill, a gospel standard minister of Luton Ebenezer Church, was engaged to preach on an anniversary service in the very near future. I was keen to hear him preach, so I began to attend their weeknight prayer meeting. My hopes had been raised that I would hear the truth about God's free sovereign grace, for it was reported that Mr Hill was a gospel standard minister. I was given to believe I would hear those truths preached by William Huntington, William Gansby and John Kershaw. I had read their autobiographies and found their writings very helpful during my time at C.J. Warden's Son and was encouraged by them as they gave all the praise and glory to Jesus Christ the Lord in man's salvation and not man. I started to go to the Beerton Church just before Mr Hill preached that anniversary year on the Wednesday night prayer meeting and sat at the back of the chapel. At that time I had no idea of the manner of service or church government or of any other ministers engaged to preach on a Lord's Day or weeknight service. The folk at Beerton used Denham's collection of hymns called The Saint's Melody, and the substance of these hymns were very pleasing to me. Even the singing pace was different to all the other churches I had attended, being that much slower. Miss Bertha Ellis would play the foot pedalled organ, and the hymn book used was Denham's collection, 19th century. The hymn singing was half the speed of the hymns sung at other churches, and the words of the hymns were wonderful and glorifying to God. The style of meeting was generally a hymn, reading from the scripture, authorised version, King James, hymn, prayer, hymn, sermon, finally a hymn, and then a closing prayer. A short while after that, I began to attend on a regular basis, and I was asked by Mr King if I would engage in prayer when asked to. It was a custom for men to pray, and women would keep silent. I did engage in prayer, and after the meeting Mr King asked me kindly to pray in future in reverent language, and address God in terms of thee and thou, rather than you and your, because I could offend people. That was their custom. I went away feeling offended, thinking all kinds of thoughts. I was upset, thinking what difference does the language make, etc. But I bowed to their request and adopted their form of speech in order not to offend. I now find it difficult today to break from that habit of using thee and thou when addressing God, i.e. reverent language. I was convinced that the word of God was infallible and true and the only rule of conduct for religious practice and belief. I believe the scriptures taught us of a sovereign, true and living God that though God be one God, in essence, and the only self-existent being, there existed three divine persons that subsisted in the divine essence, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. These three were the one God, that the divine nature was not divided. I believe the Son of God had became truly man at his incarnation, being born of the Virgin. I believed the scriptures taught that the Lord Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and truth, the only Saviour of God's elect. He being one person, yet having two natures, being God from all eternity, the divine Son of the Father, 
and by nature truly God. Yet at the incarnation he took to himself that which he was not, our human nature, and so was truly man and without sin. He was impeccable. Hence the glorious complex person of Jesus Christ is the Christ that should come into the world to save sinners. I believe that his glory was veiled during his time of humiliation. It was this same Jesus that had called me by his grace directly and made himself known to me outside the circles of any Christian church. It was he whom I sought and believed in when I went to hear Mr Hill preach at the Beaton anniversary service. He preached the distinguishing doctrines of grace very clearly. At that time I did not know many preachers who preached these things except I had heard Dr Ian Paisley preach on a record and that sermon was called Second Mile Religion. I'd also heard Dr Martin Lord-Jones preach, but he seemed not to emphasise the distinguishing doctrines of grace, although it was evident that he believed in the sovereignty of God. The churches I had attended until this time around Aylesbury and district appeared to only know Arminian doctrine and held to a false notion of universal love towards all mankind and a general atonement as distinct from particular redemption. Sadly, in 1975, one of the church members at Beerton died. It was the husband of Mrs Everett, and I was invited to the family funeral. It was there I was asked to share my testimony of conversion to the family in Aylesbury, and I felt privileged to do so. It was here that I met the Groom family, who were members of the Presswood Street Baptist Church and had moved to Brighton. It was at the Presswood Church that I met Mr Sperling Tyler when Mrs Everett introduced him to me, soon after my early days attending the Beerton Church. On that occasion, Mr Tyler was very gracious and asked me, had I found the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal saviour? To which I replied, no, rather he had found me. Mr and Mrs Groom and Mrs Everett arranged for me to visit Mr Gosden, the pastor of Galeed Chapel, Brighton, in order for me to share with him my experience of conversion at his home in Brighton. And I was very honoured to do this. We spent the afternoon together at his very modest home and he gave me a gift when leaving. It was his very own personal copies of Dr John Gill's commentary of the whole Bible in six volumes for which I felt very privileged to receive, and this became my source of instruction ever since. Here is the whole set of Dr John Gill's exposition of the whole Bible in six volumes. Mr Frank Gosden was a pastor of the church at Galeed Brighton, where Mr and Mrs Groom were in attendance, and they wanted me to meet their pastor Frank L Gosman, who also pastored churches at Heathfield, from 1939 to 1957 and Galeed Brighton from 1959 to 1980. Mr Gosden once said that he believed a twofold test could be applied to every preacher. Will the things he speaks be things that will matter when he comes to die? And will the things he speaks be of help to a poor broken-hearted sinner? At that time I had obtained a very old copy of William Huntington's book entitled The Everlasting Love of God Towards His Elect. On reading this, it became very clear that the Arminians were in the dark and I felt the only thing I could do was tell them then the opposition that I had experienced at Lowestoft would surely disappear and the news be received with gladness. Mr Groom commented on my reading the book, expressing he felt it very deep reading but I can recommend this to anyone to read. Before Mr Frank Gosson was the pastor of Galeed Church in Brighton, it was pastored by J.K. Popham, 1847 to 1947, as their pastor, who was the former editor of the Gospel Standard magazine. During my attendance of the Beerton Church, we had a visitor from a group meeting in the Bethlehem Meeting Hall at Penn, where John Metcalf was their pastor. I learned one or two things from our visitor, who was called James. He was a former Scots Presbyterian, and I think from the Free Presbyterian Church of Scotland, whom I learned were renowned Calvinists. These, I learned, had opposed the Gospel standard views of the non-offer of the Gospel, 
and also the view that the law of Moses was not the rule of life for the believer. They held to a view of the free offer of Christ to all men, a view I could not go along with, as Christ died for the elect only. Christ was to be preached to the entire world, but not on offer. The law of Moses was not the rule of life for the believer. Also, I knew that the law could not be the rule of life for the believer because of their union to him in his death and resurrection, whereby they are delivered from the law of sin and death and had a rule of life which was the whole gospel of Christ, the perfect law of liberty. James informed me that the Presbyterians were against John Metcalf and his teaching because he too, like William Huntington, taught like the Gospel Standard Articles, that the law was not the rule of life for the believer, but rather the Gospel was. This, I agreed to, was the truth. James came to our weeknight prayer meeting, and he later informed me that he wanted to hear Sperling Tyler preach, who was a pastor of the church meeting at the Dicker. So I agreed to take him one Lord's Day. We had a problem though, because I worked for Granada TV Rentals and I had a company car, which had the name of my company written on the side of the car. This was an embarrassment to him, as he was acutely aware of the disapproval of many who were opposed to any church member who had a television set. He wanted me to park the vehicle away from the chapel car park so as not to show we were connected with the chapel. I felt slightly irritated with this mode of thinking, but was sensitive enough to know how much he felt embarrassed, so we parked my company car away from the chapel. We then heard Mr Tyler speak the morning and afternoon meetings of the church. It was here I met the son of Mr Tyler and his wife, who both attended the Lindslade Strip Baptist Church near us at Beerton. In respect to the television set, I began to realise this had been an issue not only amongst the strict Baptists, but also the Brethren. I had reason to consider the whole matter at a later date. Zor Strict Baptist Chapel, Lower Dicker, was built in 1837 and enlarged in 1874. There is an extensive graveyard on three sides. Not all preaching at Beerton was good. Our visiting preachers came from various local and faraway places, and only a few from Gospel Standard causes, let alone Gospel Standard listed ministers, as I recall the names of some of those who visited us and preached we shall see who were from Gospel Standard causes and who were listed ministers. Our ministers were Mr James Hill Luton, Pastor Ebenezer Luton, and one of our trustees, Gospel Standard. Mr Collier, pastor of Lindslade, Bethel Strip Baptist Chapel, Gospel Standard. Mr Goode, pastor, Dunstable Baptist. Mr Martin Hunt, Colnbrook, Gospel Standard. Mr King, minister, Beaton Strict and Particular Baptist, a Beaton trustee. Mr Martin White, Colnbrook. Mr C. A. Wood, Pastor Croydon, Strict and Particular Baptist, Gospel Standard. Mr Hope, Pastor of Reading, Strict and Particular Baptist, Gospel Standard. Mr Howard Sayers, Minister, Watford, Strict and Particular Baptist, Gospel Standard. Mr Crane, Minister, Lake and Heath, Strict and Particular Baptist, Gospel Standard. Mr Tim Martin, Minister, Blunham, Strict and Particular Baptist. Mr Levy, Minister and Deacon, of Dunstable Baptists, Mr John Gosden, Minister at Southborough, Mr Lawrence, Evangelical from Harold, Mr Scott Pearson, Pastor Baptist, Mr Bournemouth, Minister, Bedford, Providence, Strict and Particular Baptist, one of our trustees, Mr Tim Martin, Blunham, Strict Baptist, our trustee, Mr H Sayers, Pastor, Watford, Strict Baptist, Mr Dawson, Strict and Particular Baptist from Kent, Mr Tanton, Tenterton, Strict Baptist. Mr Gould, Minister, Lions Avenue Baptist. Mr Dix, Pastor, Dunstable Baptist, Trinitarian Bible Society Representative. Mr Terence Brown, Minister and Secretary of the Trinitarian Bible Society. Mr Redhead, Minister, Potton End. Mr Gerald Buss, Minister, Strict and Particular Baptist, Gospel Standard. Mr Buss, Senior, Strict and Particular Baptist. Gospel Standard, 
Mr Howe, pastor at Ivinghoe Particular Baptist, Mr Paul Rowland, Presbyterian Leanings, Mr G Ashdown of the Protestant Alliance. It became apparent to me through listening to the various visiting ministers and my conversations with them, we had a range of ministers with differing degrees of understanding of the scripture. Some had held opposing views to each other. We had those who held to the 1689 Confession of Faith, some the 66 Grace Baptist Confession, some who were convinced of the Presbyterian position, some holding to duty faith and repentance, and one who could not accept a Beaton Articles of Religion, 1831. Not, not all the preaching at Beaton was good. We had a range of visiting ministers. Sometimes I would groan and suffer for 45 minutes of difficult things to listen to. Very few were Gospel Standard ministers and some were opposed to the Gospel Standard position. They often liked to refer to the 1689 Confession a confession that I soon realised was in error. The Scottish Free Presbyterian Churches boasted of their 1646 confession as the best. Again, I learned that too was in error. Some adhered to the 1966 Grace Baptist Confession. Again, that was in error. Some of these preachers used notes while others did not. Some preachers would not use notes and speak as they felt led to. Not that that helped, as some I felt would have benefited from notes to preach. But I realised that too was no guarantee they could be listened to. Miss Ruth Ellis. She was one of our members, and she was a gem of a person that always ready to share a word or a hymn. On several occasions midweek, we would visit her, and she would read from her books stories about choice Christian experience. Unfortunately, Ruth died, and she ended her days in Bethesda Home in Harpenden. Mr and Mrs Gurney were members, and their son John attended our church as a member of the congregation. I noticed a plaque over the fireplace of their home, and it read, A Sabbath well spent brings a week of content, but a Sabbath profaned, whate'er may be gained, is a sure forerunner of sorrow. I noticed this as, when I looked at the church's original trust deed, there was no mention of Sabbath day keeping. It was only brought up in the spurious set of articles presented to me when seeking membership of the church. Miss Bertha Ellis. She was a mother in Israel and looked after most of the visiting ministers and played the organ at our meetings, giving way to visiting people who were also able to play, such as John Snuggs, Mr Dix Sr. from Ivanhoe. Miss Bertha Ellis informed me that the church was formed in 1831 and opened by the son of John Warburton. She had the minutes of that meeting, which were signed in his own hand and the deed of trust upon which the church was formed. These articles of religion were very good and acceptable. After my warm reception, I was looking forward to hear Mr Hill of Luton preach at the anniversary service. It was good to hear Mr Hill preach and he invited me and Alan Benning to his home in Luton and we spent time together at his home. During this time I was able to take time out of work and attend the various Gospel Standard Baptist church anniversary services which were held in other causes of truth and it was because I worked for Granada TV Rentals that I was blessed because I was able to take time out of work to attend the various church anniversary services in our area. Had I been working for CJ Ward and Son, this would have proved impossible. I really look forward to these meetings and seeing the various friends of our church, and I often took with me some of the members of ours. These churches that we visited were Lindslade, Presswood, Barton Le Clay, Wadston Hill and Keatsha Chapel in Winslow. Mr Benning also informed me of another strict Baptist church at Lindslade, where Mr Collier was a pastor, another Gospel Standard minister, and we attended an anniversary service where Mr Andrew Randalls was preaching. We learned he had once been amongst the brethren, and I could tell from our conversations that he was aware of the doctrinal issues of the day, and he had a very serious disposition. We began to attend the other church anniversaries. 
and one of my favourite anniversaries was the Wadston Hill Chapel where James Hill was the preacher. This was a gospel standard cause and was founded as a particular Baptist church in 1752. I used to take Bertha and Ruth Ellis there along with Alan Bedding and Grace Knight to these meetings. I remember these meetings with fondness. Benjamin Keach's Chapel at Winslow. At this time, on one occasion each year, an anniversary meeting was held at Keach's Chapel, the oldest place of nonconformist place of worship in England, and Dr Ian Paisley was the preacher. I attended this meeting for a number of years afterwards and was greatly blessed and heard Mr Collier from Linslade and Mr Ransbottom from Luton preach at these meetings. Here is Benjamin Keach's Chapel in Winslow. Presswood Strict and Particular Baptists Another one of the local churches that we attended on their anniversary service was, that is, Alan Benning, Bertha, Ruth Ellis and Miss Grace Knight was the Presswood Strict and Particular Baptist Church. This church was a Gospel Standard Church. And it was here that I first heard Mr Sperling Tyler preach. Barton Le Clay, Hope Chapel. It was at this chapel that I took both Bertha and Ruth Ellis to hear Stanley Dells and on another occasion, Jesse Dells, to preach. During this time, I met John Snuggs from Eaton Bray, who had come to work in Aylesbury. He came to our weeknight prayer meeting at Beerton, and he introduced me to some of his friends who attended the young people's meeting that were held each month at Bethel Strict Baptist Church in Luton. Mr Ransbottom would give a talk or lecture, and afterwards we were invited to the Bethesda Rest Home at Harperton where we were given refreshments and able to meet and talk with other people from the various churches in the district. I found these meetings very helpful to meet other Christians. At this time I was working for Granada TV Rentals and within a few months I had been promoted to workshop manager. I thoroughly enjoyed the job but I found I spent more and more time thinking about my work than anything else. I was taken up with my work. The things of God paled. I went into the meetings but could not shut off from work. I soon realised I was not a good manager and found myself doing all the work. I worked long hours and my days off. Although I got the job done and we were the best branch in the district, it was all at my expense. After several months of this intense work, I began to find I could not cope with the stress the job was demanding. I went through horrifying bouts of agony and fear of not being able to cope. I began to think I was experiencing flashbacks from the bad trip on LSD. This time, however, it was in the cold light of day with no LSD. I was so ill I wanted the ground to open up and swallow me, thinking this would remove me from all the pain I was going through. My manager, Tony Burnham, who was not a Christian, had noticed a change in me at this time. When I first began to work there, I continued my habit of reading during my lunchtime break and he noticed me reading John Cowie's book and Daniel. Due to my excessive workload, I forsook my devotions and worked all the hours I could. One afternoon, on the garage roof at Mount Street, I cracked up and realised I could not cope anymore. I couldn't make decisions. I couldn't think straight. Every problem was too much to face. I ended up resigning from my manager's job becoming a normal technician. This ended in me feeling a failure and depression set in that lasted for three years. It was during this time I learned that the Christian life could be very painful which caused me to seek and rely totally on the God of all grace. I found myself feeling very lonely and wondered if I would ever find myself a wife. I found the hymns and preaching at the Beerton Church very helpful. In particular, one hymn by John Newton, I recall, was most helpful. John Newton's hymn. I ask the Lord that I might grow in faith and love and every grace. Might more of his salvation know and seek more earnestly his face. T'was he who taught me thus to pray, and he, I trust, has answered prayer. But it has been in such a way as almost drove me to despair. I hope that in some favoured hour, at once he'd answer my request, and by his love's constraining power, subdue my sins and give me rest. <laughs>
Instead of this, he made me feel the hidden evils of my heart and let the angry powers of hell assault my soul in every part. Yea, more, with his own hand, he seemed intent to aggravate my woe, crossed all my fair designs I schemed, blasted my gourds and led me low. Lord, why is this? I trembled, cried. Will thou presume thy worm to death? Tis in this way, the Lord replied, I answer prayer for grace and faith. These inward trials I employ from self and pride to set thee free and break thy schemes of earthly joy that thou mayst seek thyself in me.